afterwards. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well said, Bob. And so before, pick... so you can set up meetings or whatever. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Extremely helpful. So we're going to get into a little nitty gritty here. <clears throat> what is your thought process of the market of the note investing world right now? Where do you see things have turned? What are you guys are focusing on now? Are you guys doing anything different than you were four years ago, five years ago? Give us like a temperature gauge of what you see the note market being at your size. Well, I think right now, one of the key things, if I had to put in one word, it would be leverage. There's a lot of people that are leveraged. Their cost of capital has changed and mm. they can figure out a way to how to get rid of some of their product. Mm. It could be a small regional bank. It could be a mom and pop guy who's got 10 loans, but he's got, you know, he borrowed money at, Prime plus whatever. And now, does anybody know what Prime is today? Hi. Round Good box. question. I do have it, but yeah, go ahead. I'll I mean, look for it real quick. Yeah, I mean, it's like seven or eight. I mean, it's yep. up there, right? So all of a sudden, you went from 4% yep. cost of funds to 10% cost of funds or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And um, you have a lot of underlying lenders that are calling their loans due and, you know, or not going to extend them or the cost of funds going to go up. So they got to sell products. So we're seeing a lot of people that are, for lack of a better term, being forced to liquidate some assets. So they probably wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, in a world two years ago with, you know, basically 2% interest rates. Yeah. But now we're seeing a lot of that. So um, it, it's some amazing. Of it's, some of it's seller finance, some of it's some of that institutional type hedge fund paper and, and things like that. Yeah, I'm seeing 8.5 as a July. And uh, just a year ago, we were at five and a half. Yeah, so and you're go, right. And go back a year before that, and it was probably yeah. two and a half. Yeah, yeah, it just yeah. drops dramatically. And you're absolutely right. Those people who plan on refining or whatever are are stuck, right? Well, we, we, we have a lot of people that not only invest in notes, but invest in deals like... Um, apartments, multi yeah. right? So every syndication that I heard a pitch on in the last three or four years was, we're going to buy this deal, you know, it's at a four cap and we're going to value add and then we're going to refi out in four years and pay everybody off. Well, that model for refi was not at nine, 10, 11%. <laughs> yeah. I was refining out of four. Yeah. Right? And what are the banks <laughs> going to do? They're either going to be a property owner or they're going to have to figure out a way somebody's got to come to the table with some money yep. to pay that loan down or so forth. So uh, fortunately, like uh, Nathan said earlier, we're not quote unquote real estate. We're just related to it. Yeah. So the paper side of it is a little bit, a little bit better and, and maybe not as sensitive to that, but there's a lot of funds that they use leverage too. And we've never used leverage in our fund. Uh, wow. You know, it's just in my mind, it was, phantom returns it made it look like you were really blown and going but you know that was all you know how the numbers work when you use leverage sure. it's kind of increases it looks pretty yeah well yeah, it looks rates are low and everything's good yep yeah, yeah. And that's us too we don't leverage anything nope i'm just not comfortable with it yeah borrowing money so, on borrowed money nah no i, I agree <laughs> people yeah, do it yeah. just so they can say they grew their fund yeah, yeah, yeah. they grew their fund to uh, 50 million or whatever. Well, I think 20 is just fine if you can just raise the money and, and do whatever. So yeah. um, leverage, I think, is key and affordability just all across the board. Affordability yeah. helps create seller finance notes because you may not be able to qualify at the bank. Yeah. But on the other hand, it also creates non-performing notes because yeah. people are having a hard time buying gas, buying groceries, making, you know, it, it just makes it tough all the way around and, you know, affordable, you know, you see, oh, inflation's this, unemployment's that, and it's all a shell game. What's the real yeah. number is, you know. Yeah. Bob's I, go getting to our I go to the grocery store. I know what things cost. Bob's getting to our final question before we get there. So we're going to hold that off oh, for our you. final question, right? Okay. And, and I think you hit some really cool things there. And I think people are, are focused on trying to become Wall Street, right? That was a big focus let me grow, grow, grow and become Wall Street. And you don't have to be. Um, we both know someone who did that and they got burned out. It is extremely 
overwhelming dealing with all these borrowers and all the troubles and tribulations. And what most people don't realize who may be in the space for three years, that everyone's paper right now is doing well. They didn't live through the non-performing world of you're foreclosing on most of your portfolio. Um, and when that comes a fold, you, that's a lot to undertake. Foreclosing on multiple, multiple assets and juggling all the stuff. I don't know how some of the people do it. It's a, shocking. We did have a question, Gene, I think um, you touched on this before, Bob, but Gene asked the question is that he's heard of people buying non-performers over UPB. What are, are the cases to justify buying above the unpaid balance? Well, number one, like we talked earlier, have a low cost of capital. Um, but look, there's three factors when you're buying an MPL, right? You got BPO value, you got UPB, and then you got total legal balance. So if you are able to verify the total legal balance. because What is total legal balance? Just for those who may not know, what's give me a quick definition of total legal balance. That is the total amount that you're, in, you're in, um, entitled to collect when that loan pays off or goes to foreclosure. So it could be accrued interest, it could be advances, foreclosure fees, anything that, whether it's the court or whoever happens to approve the foreclosure, um, the servicer usually says in order to pay off that loan, like for example, let's say this loan was modified, okay, five or six years ago, and they did a deferment, they deferred mm. principal. Well, the UPV may be a hundred grand, Mm. there could be a $60,000 deferred principal that's due at the end. Well, that's part sure. of your collectible balance. Yeah. Plus your accrued interest, plus your foreclosure fees and, and tax advances and so forth. Um, so all of a sudden you may owe a hundred grand, but you're entitled to $180,000, right? So if I bid 102 on 180, I'm over UPB, but I'm still, you know, quick math, say 75% of what the total legal balance is. Mm -hmm. And to your point about back in the day, back in the day, most properties were underwater, meaning they owed more than they were worth. Now there's a lot of equity there too. So the BPO may be up there. So we focus more on BPO and total legal balance than UPB. And that's why when you right. read that the Fannie trade that just happened was in the high 90s of UPV, it didn't disclose what the total legal balance was. So I'm willing to bet that was probably high 70s of UPV. Um, and I think the BPO was in the 50s. I think it had so much okay. equity in there if I remember looking at it. So that would be why um, you do have to verify that. There was somebody puts on the spreadsheet, hey, they owe me $188,000. Trust but verify. As yes. My friend Ronald Reagan once said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good, good example there. You know, a lot of people forget about that total legal balance uh, is collectible. And most sellers will expect you to be bidding based on that number because you can collect on it. Now, the hard part, like you said, is verify it because some people throw all kinds of stuff in there um, and that's not collectible based on the agreement in the uh, documents. Um, so, it, there's been many times where we've looked at that kind of stuff and I've seen huge spreads in this stuff. And that comes back to the point you need to verify. We saw loans where the UPB was 50 and the legal balance is 150,000. And I said, that just doesn't make sense. It just, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. So uh, absolutely. I'd be verifying, talk to your servicer, talk to your seller, and just say, I want a list of the things that you're saying you are owed. Um, yeah, and the go through that. Kind of should be able to also provide that payoff information. Yeah. And Demand, yeah. You know how they're doing and, and to be honest with you there could be some jurisdictions across the country where the judge is like no you can't have 10 years of accrued interest mm -hmm. and your foreclosure judgment is for x and you know yeah. uh, so you just kind of you know take everything and run it through your buying financial modeling and, and figure sure. out what makes the most sense sure. i've got one that's actually paying off next week and just to go along with this so the unpaid balance is around eighty seven thousand. Uh, total legal balance that we're getting paid off on is around 92. So there's about $5,000, you know, that makes extra. Sense. Uh, and that's late fees, that's legal fees, uh, that kind of thing that goes into that. And so that, yeah. it, I mean, $5,000, uh, that makes a difference. You know, that's that a little makes extra a juice for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then you guys also buy bankruptcy notes and stuff like that. Do you guys like bankruptcy notes or do you guys stay away from them? Um, I think Nathan summed it up earlier with his, it depends answer on some questions. Yeah. Um, 
cash flow and BK loans, we're we're okay with. Um, chapter, I mean, yes, we buy them. We don't chase them. Yeah. Um, if it's in a portfolio, we're going to buy, you know, we're going to bid them. We'll bid them differently, obviously, than a, an RPL or an MPL, just depending on what it is. Sure. Uh, but we don't filter and say kick out all the BK loans or whatever. Sure. But, you know, we know folks that, who have models that all they want to buy is BK loans. Yeah. Like, we're not that guy either. Yeah. Uh, but if you give me 20 loans and two of them are BK, then, okay, as long as I get all 20 loans, I'll take the two BKs. Yeah. And the BK loans will definitely juice your returns with the arrears uh, for period of time, depending on how long that period is. Um, so let's get a more temperature gauge. What are you guys are more focused on right now? Are you guys buying more performing notes or not performing? What are you guys seeing? Uh, that's a good question. For a long time, we were buying a lot of re-performing loans. Right now, I would say seller finance performing loans is, is good. We, um, we do have a good pipeline of MPLs. Okay. Um, but it's not as large as obviously we would like. Everybody thinks MPLs are sexy and I want them. And then when you start digging into them, <laughs> um, the, the factor of how much hair they have on them, um, yeah. maybe it's like, well, I'm not that excited about it. So, uh, I would say we like cash flow, um, especially for those of you who think it's sexy to have a capital fund and so forth. And when we first started our fund, I think 2013, uh, you know, we were probably 70% MPLs. Yeah. Um, and it didn't take long for us to figure out that we needed a much better blend of performing loans because you got to have cash flow. You can't pay out returns on a negative cash flow MPL deal that's going to be resolved in a good way, but down the road. Yeah. Um, so we blended it. And by the time, you know, our fund at its, at its height was probably... 70% performing 30% MPLs. And uh, we typically don't play a lot in the REO space. I mean, obviously you have an outperforming loan, you foreclose, you end up with REO and we'll usually sell or finance it. Uh, if you just can't sell it retail, um, but we don't chase REO per se. And yeah. um, which uh, you guys were talking earlier about reverse mortgages and, and we're seeing a lot of Heckums. Yep. Um, really, you're it's a it's an REO play. If you're not good at working your way out of REO, mm -hmm. and for those of you that don't know, a reverse mortgage that we're seeing on the secondary market now is where the borrower is deceased and the property is vacant and supposedly secured. Um, okay, but yes. there's not going to be any loan mod unless you might have an heir that thinks they are entitled to it and probate and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So you're going to end up with the property. Okay, well. Dave, you got yeah. somebody who lived in that house, had a reverse mortgage. They died when they were 85 years old, right? If you like shag carpet and avocado colored <laughs> appliances, then we got a deal for you. Uh, I mean, they're going to, you know what these houses look like, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, my dad's 90 years old. <clears throat> when, he, when he passes away, I don't want anything to do with this house. It's yeah. just, it's got so much stuff in it from, however many years he's been in there that I can only imagine what would happen. So yeah. it's, you know, but if you're good at REO and you have boots on the ground, and you know how to do it. It's a great play. It's just not our cup of tea. Yeah. It's great for those looking for fix and flips or, you know, typically want to buy at the foreclosure auction. If you are that kind of investor, listen to this reverse mortgages when we have it on is a great topic to learn about. Yep, yeah. I agree. Yeah. We'll be talking about that in the next couple of weeks and I've done yeah. a bunch and our guest has done a whole bunch. So yeah. that'll be a good, Good discussion. Yeah. yeah. So we've also touched upon <laughs> hypothecations. Do you guys get involved in hypothecations much at all? Uh, we've made some. We've made some loans to folks against their note portfolios. Okay. Right. So, for example, we'll lend up to um, sixty-five percent of the portfolio UPV, okay. and um, fifty-five percent of the cash flow. Right. So, in other words, let's say you have. A million dollar portfolio, you can borrow six hundred fifty thousand dollars, and 